in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance help me in my quest permit me to pass the ultimate test help me in my quest permit me to pass the ultimate test assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to another live edition of ask Huda. as usual we begin by praising the almighty allah alone and sending the greatest peace and salutations upon prophet muhammad may the greatest peace and blessings be upon him then i would like to remind you of our contact informations and how and where you can watch us live beginning with the area code 001361 Four eight nine one five zero three. Alternatively, area code zero zero one three four nine eight zero six zero zero two five. We have also two local numbers with area code zero zero two then zero one double zero five four six nine three two three. And finally, area code zero zero two then zero two three eight triple five one three four. You can watch us live on NileSat, IntelSat, Winnie, as well as the Nigerian satellite if you live in West Africa. As far as for um, as for the social media platform, whether the YouTube Huda TV on the YouTube, or the Facebook page Huda TV Facebook page, or my personal M Salah official Facebook page, and without any further ado, let's take some callers. Assalamu alaikum, brother Abdullah from Germany. Welcome to Ask Huda. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, mm -hmm. there was a time when I knew very little about Islam and in my early teenage years and when I was a kid I broke some things, I stole some things, I cheated people and now I have debts, you know, uh, using train and the like and I need to pay kafara because there were many vows which I broke so mm. I need to pay much, pretty much but that's not my question, the thing is at the moment I have no money and my first salary will, will be in seven years, inshallah. So I, when, when I get money, I need it. So someone offered me to give me a gift. Okay, that's my question. And the gift, I may ask him for money and use that for debt and kafara, or I may ask him to buy a tablet for me, mm. which would not be the priority. Do you understand? So is it permissible to tell him to buy a tablet for me or must I use any money I get directly for debts and kafara? That's my question. Okay, any other questions? Um, I could maybe, now I don't know if that changes anything, but uh, the last two years were pretty rough, you know, I got beaten up, uh, I, ro I lost much weight, I had worse worse, so I don't know, and that's like the first Thing I could get. I don't know whether this is an effect. Abdullah, thank you for calling in. First of all, I'm very pleased and happy to hear that young man feels remorse for what he has done in the past. He has repented and he is willing to reconcile with Paul's <coughs> with, with those whom he have hurt or broke their properties and also to make up for the promises or the oath which he have taken upon himself and did not fulfill. And if we check out the verse of Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter number 5, we realize that the Almighty Allah says, وَلَكِنْ يُؤَاخِذُكُمْ بِمَا عَقَّدْتُمُ الْأَيْمَانِ فَكَفَّارَتُهُ إِقْعَامُ عَشَرَةِ مَسَاكِينَ مِنْ أَوْسَطِ مَا تُطْعِمُونَ أَهْلِيكُمْ أَوْ كِسْوَتُهُمْ أَوْ تَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةً فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَّامِ ذَلِكَ كَفَّارَةُ أَيْمَانِكُمْ إِذَا حَلَفْتُمْ Somebody will say, Sheikh, he's asking about vows and promises and the ayah is talking about an oath which you have confirmed that you're going to do this in the name of Allah or you're going to stop doing this and you still violated your oath, the same. Vow or oath, the ransom is the same. So what is it? Feeding 10 poor people one meal each or clothing them, buying them an outfit. Abdullah from Germany said, I've been broke and I anticipate my first salary to be seven years from now. And I'm very keen to pay the ransom and get it off my back. What am I supposed to do? فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَّامِ 
then if you cannot afford it, you can fast for three days and they don't have to be consecutive. How many times you broke an oath or a promise, a covenant you've taken upon yourself as nazr? Maybe 10, okay, 10 times three, that is 30. You can fast every now and then, and then you mark, I fasted for two days, for three days, and you scratch them, you skip those days, alhamdulillah, until you make sure that you fasted an equal kafara for the number of vows or oath which you have not fulfilled. May Allah make it easy for all of us to return unto Allah with sincere repentance and may Allah make it easy for us that the Almighty Allah accept our repentance and grant us forgiveness. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Abdullah from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, Shaykh, my question is related to uh, investing in an Islamic uh, in an in, in Islamic in company. So in Pakistan, we have this company called Al Mizan uh, Al Mizan Trust, and it's uh, on its board of uh, Sharia board. They have Mufti Taqi Usmani, uh, if you've heard of him, and. The concern that I have is that uh, one of the funds that I am looking to invest in, it's uh, it's it in in the rules and regulations they state that it uses the method of wakala for Islamic investment. Now I've heard of mudaraba, musharaka, and these other terms, but I'm not familiar of, with wakala. In this, they say that. I invest my money with this company and they pro I receive all the profits while the company charges a fee for its services. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know that is this something that is Sharia, that is fine, that is uh, that falls under Sharia because I couldn't find anything about this term I, Wakala. Abdullah, and uh, obviously all, because as Muslims we are very concerned about riba. Abdullah, I... I was under the impression that Mufti Taqi Uthmani passed away. Am I correct? Yes, he is on the board, yes. No, no. I heard that he passed away. Um, Mufti Taqi Uthmani? Uh, no. Uh... Okay, double check anyway. Let me explain a few things relating to your question. The terms that you've used, mudaraba, murabaha, musharaka, wikala, these are all approved terms and contracts in business transaction in Sharia. Simply because Allah the Almighty said, وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعَ وَحَرَّمَ الْرِبَا They undergo the big umbrella of business transaction, selling and buying. The details cannot be discussed in a live program like that, unless if I dedicate the whole episode to hear from you and you quote upon me the conditions of the contract, then we'll go through them and tell you what is halal and what is haram. And name does not really make much of a difference. So when you say it is called halal fund, it's called mizan, it's called sama, it's called uh, whatever, uh, may Allah bless them. I'm not going to judge any business transaction or contract because of the name. Obviously, when you have such uh, reliable, renowned mufti on board, that should be sufficient. You don't have to ask me, alhamdulillah, okay? But generally speaking, if anyone is interested in knowing the details of any business transaction that they're going through, you can book a private session. You have 30 minutes, half hour, you can say whatever, we can read the contract together. We can go through it. I tell you what is halal and what is haram. And if it is all halal, bismillah, proceed on. So this is dedicated for that. The counseling and the consultation sessions. We have counseling and consultation sessions. Whether for marriage counseling or for business consultations with regards to halal and haram. Finally, al-wikala which you refer to is when you give your money to a professional firm 
company or an individual trustworthy whom you know that they're going to invest in halal and basically they are making an effort the their investment is in the effort they know better where to invest in landscape or real estate or gold and silver jewelry or whatever as long as it is halal fund and they say you know for running your business and investing your money whatever profit comes out of this investment I charge you a percentage or a fixed rate I take a salary um, 200k per month per year if you agree to that al is valid is permissible further details we can discuss it inshallah in the consultation session barakallahu feekum assalamu alaikum Ulad from the UK, welcome to Ask Wada. Salam alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, Sheikh, I would, I would like you to clarify me two things about the Day of Judgment. Mm -hmm. um, recently, I've been to a lecture where my Sheikh said that some people who uh, pass the Sirat, they're going to go to the Hout. But they're not allowed to drink with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because they done bid'ah. My confusion is, I always thought if someone passes the sirat, he's safe, he goes to Jannah. But yet these people are not allowed to drink. So why did they pass the sirat in the first place? And secondly, I would like to ask as well is, um, I heard all the people who go to Qantara, they pass the sirat. But there are some people with a lot of sins and they go back, they go, like they lose all the good deeds because back bad, bad things they did to the people. So my question, why do they pass this sirat if they're also going to be thrown back to health by, from the Pantara? That's what the Sheikh said. So those two things I was not very clear to me. Shukran, glad. Uh, we only have one minute or less for the break, so let me wrap it up quickly. A sarat, which is a bridge across and on top of hellfire. According to the hadith, because it is entirely unseen to us, we haven't been there, we haven't seen hellfire, we haven't seen a sarat, we haven't seen the hawd. We've been informed by uh, some Quranic references and by some hadith in this regard. The information is from the Prophet ﷺ. It is going to be sharper than the sword and thinner than the hair. And people will cross over this bridge, which is on top of hellfire, based on the level of their iman and piety. So the disbelievers from the beginning will be taken. And the wicked, the adulterers, the adulteresses, and the alcoholic, they will be taken with the hooks in order to be purified from their sins. Believers, even if they are being punished, purified from their sins, will end up in heaven. But after how long? Allah knows best until Allah the Almighty will pardon them. And there is a hadith with regards to Al Hawd. Al Hawd is like a pound or basin, huge uh, pond, uh, before entering heaven. Allah said in the Quran, Inna kal kawthar. What is Al Kawthar? It's a river in heaven. Its water will pour luck and the drain into that basin or Al Hawd. People will be very thirsty. And the Prophet ﷺ will be ahead of the believers at Al Hawd. Well, he will drink and invite the Ummah, his followers, to drink. In the hadith, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Some people, you there do na anil hawd. They will be warded off, they will be pushed away and prevented from drinking. So, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would recognize them by their names, by their you know, identities, and he will say, Oh Allah, those are my ummah. Why aren't they being prevented from drinking? So, the Almighty Allah will tell him, they are being stopped and prevented from drinking from the Hawt because they have done a lot of changes in the deen, especially in the matters of belief and aqeedah. 
those who curse the companions of the Prophet, the mothers of the believers, there is no way that Allah will let them drink from the hawd of the Prophet Those who assume that there was a Prophet after Muhammad they, they will never find a chance to drink from the hawd of the Prophet So bearing Muslim names, belonging to Muslim families and Muslim societies, will make them appear as Muslims. But Allah the Almighty will explain to his Prophet وسلم, that they have changed. So the Messenger of Allah will tell them, suhqan, suhqan, stay away, stay away. Let them go to hellfire. I disassociate myself from them. It is time to take a short break and we'll be back inshallah in a few minutes. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the second segment of today's Ask Oda program. We have some callers on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Muhammad from Bahrain. Assalamu alaikum. Wa, wa alaikum salam, uh, Shaykh. How are you, Shaykh? <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I'm doing good. And you? Alhamdulillah, Shaykh. Uh, I'm also fine. Uh, Shaykh, my question is, uh, uh, is it permissible for us to, you know, suppose we have some old clothes uh, or utensils, uh, like kitchen utensils. So can we give those as a, in the form of a sadaqa? Is it have the same reward as the giving the sadaqa as a cash or money? Anything that you can help and assist others with is perceived as a charity. But... According to the Quran, the Almighty Allah says, لَن تنالوا البر حتى تنفقوا مما تحبون وما تنفقوا من شيء فإن الله به عليم Third chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Imran. So to achieve the highest level of piety, you should give and spend out of that which you love, not the leftover or things you are about to throw away. Yet, if you have used clothes and utensils, you have the choice of selling them, giving them to Salvation Army, or giving them in a charity to people who are in need. Give them uh, to those who are in need, and it still counts as a charity. The greatest reward is when you give of the new stuff which you like. Sadaqah is not only in the form of cash, in the form of cash, in the form of goods, in the form of physical help, in the form of a good word and smile. Barakallah feek. Our brother uh, who called before uh, the break about the hawd, the pond. A few facts I would like to add. Number one, it, it is not only Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who would have the pond or al hawd, or if you like to call it a huge basin. Every prophet will have one. So that the followers of every prophet will gather around their prophet to drink out of it. When the Almighty Allah will order Israfil to blow in the trumpet for the second time, Then all the dead will come out of their graves. They were even ash, dust. Those who died thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years ago. Every, uh, every living creature who lived one day will be revived. Then they will come out of the graves and their bodies will be reassembled and they will be extremely thirsty. So every prophet will invite his followers to drink out of their pond. Muhammad sallallahu wasallam was told also that he will have the hout where all the followers will come. Which means in this case al hout happens to be before crossing on as -Sarat. Is there any different opinion which says that al hout is going to be after Surat? Yes, and Imam Bukhari chose this opinion. 
But the vast majority of the scholars say that the tartib and the right order is al hawd before crossing on as -Sarat. And al hawd is when people will be standing for 50,000 years of our time and people will be extremely thirsty. So Muhammad, peace be upon him, will invite his followers to drink out of it. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Aisha from India. Aisha. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, it's a, my name is actually Maisha, not Aisha. Maisha. Uh, yes. And what does Maisha means? Uh, I think it means pretty. The <laughs> beer? I think it means pretty. Pretty. Okay, pretty. How can I help you? Uh, it's not really a question, but I had called you last year requesting you to make dua so that, so that I get into a medical college. And this year I did get into a medical college. So I wanted you to make dua for me so that I succeed and become a very successful doctor and make dua for my parents, my siblings and my grandparents. And in a few years, you call me again and say, I graduated and I want you to make dua for me to get married and have kids, right? Sure, inshallah. Yeah. Maisha, may Allah bless you and make you a successful physician, medical doctor to help people. And may Allah uh, bless you with the best spouse and goodly offspring. And may Allah bless your parents. Thank you for calling in and sharing the good news with me. Barakallah feekum, Maisha. Ibrahim from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, ya Ibrahim. Ibrahim, assalamu alaikum. I almost think India is further away from Nigeria. So why calls from Nigeria take a while before they connect? Yeah, Ibrahim. Okay, uh, let's take another yes, caller. Uh, Nam or not Nam? Ibrahim. Okay, yes. Salamu alaikum. Let's take another caller, please. Assalamu alaikum. Abdullah from Australia. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum How are you? Uh, good. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, Sheikh, does Umrah uh, wipe away minor sins or major sins? And does Arafah, fasting the day of Arafah, does it wipe away major sins or minor? Barakallahu feekum. Every hadith that speaks about wiping out sins due to uh, fasting or performing Umrah, it is pertaining to minor sins. Fasting on the day of Arafah expiates the sins of the past year and the year to come. Minor sins. Well, uh, what about actually going for Hajj and standing on Arafah on the day of Arafah on the ninth day? Well, if the person, the Hajj, who went for Hajj or went for Umrah, repented. He used to drink and he said no more. He used to watch what is forbidden and he said I quit. He used to deal with riba, he said we'll never do it again. The sin will be forgiven. But somebody who went for Hajj, a woman who went for Hajj and she cried a lot on the day of Arafah, MashaAllah. But she wears those tight jeans and blouses and she's not wearing hijab. Why and how the sin of not wearing hijab will be forgiven? On what basis and for what reason? Nothing have happened. Nothing has changed. You understand? So for major sins, you want them to be forgiven with Hajj or with Umrah, make Tawbah. And then while you are in Hajj and Umrah, Seek forgiveness for such major sins and make a promise that you will not do them again 
And while fearing remorse, they will be expiated as the Prophet said. Those who sell liquor, beer, lotto tickets, and Allah invited them for Hajj. And on the day of Arafah, they shed a lot of tears. They cried. But soon after they returned, they resumed working, earning haram, and so on. Their sin has not been forgiven. I'm talking about this sin of earning unlawfully. It has not been forgiven. May Allah guide us to what is best. Assalamu alaikum, Mustafa from Italy. Can you hear me, Mustafa? Assalamu alaikum. Mustafa, can you hear me? Okay, Mustafa is kind of busy now. Let's take another caller or actually take a break. It is time to take a break. Tell Mustafa to call after the break, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. I will see you at the other end in a few minutes, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the third and final segment of today's Ask Huda live show. Awad from Sudan, welcome to Ask Huda. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You sound Sudanese. Are you Sudanese? Yeah, yeah, I'm Sudanese. Jazakallah wa khayr. I mean, thank you so much. You're definitely Sudanese, mashallah. I love Sudanese. Yeah. First of all, I want you to make dua for our country. I should, and I've been doing so. May Allah bless you. May Allah, may Allah keep peace in your country and all over the Muslim world. I mean, may Allah keep you united and protect you against every harm and all kind of harm. I mean. Barak Allah I have been with a lot from from Huda TV and your programs in particular. Oh, mashallah. Mashallah. You barak laka fi ilmika wa amalika, mashallah. Ameen. Ameen. Such beautiful dua. Thank you, Awad, from Sudan. Barak Allah fikum. Obviously, I visited Sudan a few times, mashallah. Uh, some of the kindest people on earth and very generous, mashallah. And that's why uh, Sudan now is in need for a lot of your prayers. May Allah grant them peace, prosperity, and security. Ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, some caller on the line is asking right now, you can hear him though, about the Tawbah prayer which is rather known as Raka'atay Listafar. The Tawbah prayer or the two units for seeking forgiveness have been narrated in a hadith by Ali ibn Abi Talib from Abu Bakr al-Siddiq from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He said that whenever a Muslim commits a sin, then he perfects his ablution and prays two units without focusing on anything other than his prayer, with full tranquility and concentration, and seeks forgiveness from Allah for the sin, the sin which he has committed will be as if it hasn't done, if it didn't take place before. So these two units are very important. Whenever you commit a sin, you rush to repent. And somebody will say, what if it is a while later? How long after I still can pray the two rakahs with the intention of tawbah from a particular sin, a particular sin, even if it is months or years later? So if you remember that last year, you've done something you know it is wrong and you want Allah to forgive you, you can simply say, Astaghfirullah, Tubtu ila Allah, I will not do it again. 
And to guarantee that it will be forgiven, make perfect ablution, pray to rakas with the intention of seeking forgiveness from this particular sin, the sin will be as if it didn't take place. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Aisha from Pakistan, I want to make sure that she's Aisha, not Maisha. Aisha? Yes, I'm Aisha from Pakistan. Okay, Aisha, go ahead. How can I help you? Okay, so my question is that my husband, uh, my husband completed, fulfilled my all requirements, but he didn't give me a single penny in my hand. So if I take uh, the, the money from the wallet without his permission, is it uh, possible? Is it permissible or not? I thought you just said that he fulfills all his responsibilities. You don't need anything. So why do you have to take money out of his wallet? Aisha? Aisha, can you hear me? Okay. What? Yeah, can you hear me? No problem. Listen to this. A woman asked the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, your question. She was actually Hind bin Utba, Abu Sufyan's wife. She said, O Prophet of Allah, my husband is tight, kind of cheap. He doesn't spend much. Am I being blameworthy if I take out of his money without his knowledge? So the Messenger of Allah said, peace be upon him, take what is sufficient for you and your kids bil ma'roof on reasonable basis. And mashallah, Aisha, when she started off, Asking the question, she said, my husband fulfills all his responsibilities. So does he feed you guys good food, buys you good clothes, and mashallah, you're living in a nice place? Yes. So give me a reason why do I have to stretch out my hand and take out of his wallet without his knowledge? If there is a reason, like he doesn't buy me medication, take, no problem. As the Prophet ﷺ said, on reasonable basis, but I was dying to buy the ring and he won't give me the $2,000. Can I take it from his money without his knowledge? No, he cannot do that. This is not permissible. And I advise all the husbands, if Allah blessed you with wealth, then prosper your family. Make them live in a level that is, you know, matching your, uh, uh, your earning, matching your positions, matching the kind of prosperity that Allah blessed you with. Because whatever you spend on your family, provided it is earned lawfully, and it is spent on halal, is an act of charity. This is what our most beloved said. When you buy food, when you buy clothes, when you buy medication, when you buy school supplies for your kids, when your child is asking you for a bike, when your daughter is asking you for a barbie, when your wife is asking you for a dress, and you buy all of that, it is an act of charity. You will be rewarded for it. As the Prophet ﷺ said, provided. By that you're seeking the pleasure of Allah. You cannot be seeking the pleasure of Allah when you buy tight clothes for your daughter, you know that she goes outside wearing those tight jeans. This is not seeking the pleasure of Allah. You cannot be seeking the pleasure of Allah when you know that this money which you have given them or spent on them is a bribery money or earned unlawfully from interest. Okay? Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Khalid from Ethiopia, welcome to Ask Huda. Khalid. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam uh, again. Sheikh, I have, I have a question regarding my OCD. I have OCD and I want to if uh, I can take uh, psychotherapy from non Muslim therapists. Uh, must it be from a Muslim or 
Should it be, must it be from? Uh, is okay. it obligatory <coughs> for it to be from um, <coughs> Muslims? And uh, there are therapies that are recommended by the non-Muslim therapies, like uh, exposure and response prevention. And uh, I wanted to know if I can take these therapies. Khalid. First of all, we're all praying for you. May Allah grant you cure. Secondly, it is permissible to go to a non-Muslim internist, pulmonist, cardiologist, dentist. There is no problem whatsoever, okay? Uh, because this guy is very famous and he's very sharp and smart in his uh, profession and his speciality. Everybody praises him. Go! Including psychologists and psychiatrists, psychotherapists. There's only one concern here. In the psychotherapy, the therapist, if he's not Muslim, cannot relate to your concerns about waswasa in the wudu, waswasa in the prayer, waswasa in the acts of worship. And he might uh, advise, you know what, just go and make a wudu, man. You know, if it bothers you every time you pray, you don't have to pray. Well, he's not Muslim. It is none of his concern. So he would look at it from a pure therapeutic point of view, not from a religious or spiritual point of view. That's why we say as a Muslim psychiatrist in this case will be highly recommended. Highly recommended because he can relate to what you're saying. He knows that you're having a problem while making wudu or during the process of istinja. So also in the sessions afterward, in order to recover, you definitely need a Muslim therapist to follow up with. But is it halal? It is halal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Asif from the UK, welcome to Ask Uda. Asif? Yes, yes, can you hear me? Clearly, mashallah, go ahead. I have a question. Uh, what happened is uh, I got married. Uh, my brother uh, got me married uh, back home. Uh, I live in the UK and right now. Uh, my, married, uh, my brother got me married back home to somebody from my village. Now, now the problem is uh, we do not get it on uh, in a marriage where we commit uh, more guna than uh, sawab and uh, divorce is not an option for me. And I really don't know what to do anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You ask if why do you commit more janah than, than thawab? Why? Like what? Because we are married, but we don't have no uh, intimate relationship. Okay. And why so, not? Uh, obviously, I understand that Islamically, why it's not? her right uh, for, yeah. for me to be intimate with her. It's just stuff happened. Uh, we had fights and our family got involved in... Uh, Nothing has happened, and now we're we're at the point where how, I just don't want to look at her how anymore. Long, how long have you been married? How long you been married, Asif? Nine years. Nine years. All right. Thank you, Asif. Now listen to the answer. Every couple in the whole world, they fight. Sometimes, occasionally, and sometimes on a regular basis, it's like a routine in their lives. That doesn't mean that they have to be separated. When he said that we do more junah than thawab, junah or gunah means uh, sins, big sins. So if you and your wife are okay with that, even if you don't get intimate and she doesn't have a problem with that, don't divorce her. But if this is problematic for her and for you, and you believed after counseling and after consulting people of expertise, that life between you both is not working and you don't have any chemistry, especially if you don't have kids. If you have kids, yeah, you have to rethink about it. You have to reconsider this option. And it's not easy to give you this advice right away, not knowing all the details of your relationship and whether you have kids or not. For the sake of our kids to live under the same roof with both parents, we're willing to sacrifice a lot of things. Barakallahu feekum. 
May Allah bless you all. May Allah reconcile between you and your spouse. And my dear viewers, may Allah accept from all of us our humble effort. May Allah pardon us for our minor and major sins and guide us to what is best and keep us all rightly guided on his straight path. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum subhanak allahumma bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Allah is my heart's speech Mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance